Okay. Uh, all right. So good evening, everybody. If uh, you're here to hear Byron Rempo Burkholder talk about his recent trip to the West Bank, you're at the right spot. And um, I'm just going to, my name is Peter Larson. I'm the chair of the Ottawa Forum on Israel-Palestine. This is one of our um, monthly webinars, but we won't be doing another one until the fall now. We'll be doing them over the summer. Educational web webinars where we bring people in from around the world. Today, Byron is actually in Winnipeg, but he was in the West Bank, and that's what he's going to talk about. Um, uh, we will be recording this session. So um, er, anybody who wants to have a copy, anybody who's registered for this event will get a copy of it and you can share it with your friends quite freely. I'll, I'll send the information in a follow-up um, email. Um, I have enabled the chat function, which enables all participants to make comments that they want, uh, either to Byron or me um, on the chat function um, or to each other or just to everybody, you can do that. Uh, however, Byron and I are going to keep our eyes on the Q&A function. So if you have a specific question, I suggest you put it in the Q&A function and uh, we'll try to keep an eye an eye on that. Uh, we It's now 7.01. We plan to wind up somewhere shortly after eight o'clock, partly depending on how tired Byron gets and how tired I get and um, how many questions we have as well. So once again, thank you very much for, for, for joining us. And now, my pleasure to welcome Byron. Byron, thank you very much for spending a summer evening with us. Um, we're really glad to have you. Well, thank you, Peter. It's uh, a real honor to be uh, part of your webinar series. <laughs> um, well, Byron, um, uh, the honor is reciprocal. Um, Byron, we a lot. Of, I'm sure all the people on this call are interested and concerned about the situation um, in all of Palestine. Uh, to all Palestinians, whether it's in the West Bank or in Jerusalem or inside Israel or refugee camps, your particular focus this time around was on the West Bank. Uh, and even this week, there have been two quite dramatic announcements that have almost been ignored in the Canadian press. There was a uh, an attack by the Israeli military on, in Ramallah. They blew up the house of a family of a young man who was accused of terrorism. He hasn't been convicted of it. And the house they blew up was his family's house, not the house where he lived. And that was in the middle of Ramallah, right near the seat of the PA. So if there needed to be any demonstration of the fact that there really is um, just a one state reality, that was pretty much to humiliate the PA. And then today, I got some more information, some emails coming from the Balata refugee camp in Nablus about another Israeli incursion in Nablus. Um, they went and they destroyed a house and um, killed one or two people and now this more information is coming in. So it's a very tense situation in the West Bank and my hat's off to you for going and spending some time there. But Byron, why don't I just start off uh, asking you to explain to us who you are, and why most a normal person would not go off to the West Bank for a couple of weeks. So what's your interest and in, uh, how do you come to be doing that? Okay, hello everybody, yeah. Um... Uh, my wife and I, Melita, and I spent uh, three months uh, in 2016 in Bethlehem. We were uh, part of um, a program with Mennonite Church Canada, serving in a Christian college uh, in uh, Bethlehem. And uh, that, that experience, that volunteer experience, uh, basically um, was the beginning of our, our, our passion for Palestinian human rights. Uh, uh, we encountered the Christian community there, which was asking us to go home and uh, do some advocacy, and we took that seriously. Uh, our denomination, Mennonite Church Canada, passed a resolution on uh, Israel-Palestine uh, that summer, and, um, and since then, I have been uh, chairing a network uh, within our denomination, the Mennonite Church Canada-Palestine-Israel Network. So seven years later, uh, Melita and I felt that it was time to refresh our acquaintance with what was going on there. We'd come through COVID, we were fully retired now, and uh, we, we thought we'd just uh, go at our own initiative uh, as tourists, but we also wanted to learn more about the situation there. And uh, so we, we went uh, 
uh, under a tourist visa, but we were also guests of Mennonite Central Committee for most of the time there. Uh, that's uh, what, does that mean? what does that mean yeah. to be a guest, a guest of them when you're there? Yes, uh, Mennonite Central Committee is a humanitarian organization that has worked in Palestine uh, since 1949 uh, in humanitarian work and uh, peace promotion. And uh, so we went uh, kind of under their uh, under their umbrella. We stayed in their uh, guest suite in East uh, Jerusalem for most of the time there. Uh, but we also uh, spent 10 days in Hebron um, or Al-Khalil in Arabic uh, with another group uh, that Mennonites have associated with. Uh, um, and I'm, I'm going to not always name names here for security's sake, but uh, a group of uh, Palestinian advocates in Hebron who uh, do uh, some monitoring of the situation there and reporting and hosting international visitors. And so we we spent uh, 10 days in the old city of Hebron. Uh, uh, that was uh, um, toward the end of January. And then Wait, we moved- so Let me just let's re recap here. So you arrive in Ben Gurion Airport, right? You arrive in Ben Gurion. <laughs> And you yeah. go to East Jerusalem, where you stay for a number of days at this uh, house. That... Yeah, we 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 stayed uh, for one night in East Jerusalem, and then we went straight to Hebron and stayed uh -huh. there for ten days in the old city of Hebron uh, till the end of uh, January, and then uh, for the rest of our time, we were in uh, based in East Jerusalem in the Beit Hanina area. Um, and uh, we, from there, we went, made forays into Ramallah and to Bethlehem mostly, and also into some other places in the in the West Bank. We had hoped to do some hiking in the northern West Bank um, as part of our time there, uh, but we were advised not to go there. Uh, as you remember, uh, the the New Year soon into the New Year, there was a, a real rise in uh, violent incidents attacks of the Israeli uh, army on uh, Palestinian communities and also settler violence toward Palestinians. Byron, and, how did you get around there? Do you, did you have your own driver or do you take public transportation? Oh, we, we, wanted to, we wanted to live in these places and not just be uh, doing the typical tourist thing. So we, we decided to, to use public transportation. So mainly buses and uh, what they call service, these, uh, these vans that go between communities. Uh, and uh, yeah, some of our friends uh, sometimes uh, drove us around, but uh, uh, ma mainly it was buses and service. And in Jerusalem, we, we sometimes use the tram that, uh, that goes from West Jerusalem into some of the East Jerusalem settlements. So that's how we got around the Israeli Jewish settlements in East Jerusalem. That's, a, that's right. Israeli. Uh, yes. And East Jerusalem, for those of you who uh, I, I'm sort of making a guess here that we have a spectrum of, of people who are uh, different levels of understanding. But East Jerusalem is still considered occupied by most of the world, uh, although Israel has annexed it. So we were in occupied East Jerusalem and East Jerusalem uh, is uh, is pocked with Israeli uh, Jewish settlements uh, surrounding often uh, um, Palestinian Arab communities right. in East Jerusalem, and East Jerusalem, uh, don't forget, is is the the uh, the part of the city that the Palestinians would like to claim as their future capital city. So, uh, the, uh, but uh, for all intents and purposes, if you're a visitor. If you're in East Jerusalem, on the surface, it seems like it's just one big city, although um, you look closely and it's, it's, it's very divided ethnically. You know, I, you probably know this, but the, when you get a taxi in West Jerusalem, a lot of Israeli taxi drivers won't drive you to East Jerusalem. They think it's like Harlem or too dangerous or whatever. So the, the, the people who live there have a very clear idea of what's East and West, although to a naive tourist like me, you can wander across the line and not just notice that it starts, it starts to get a little bit shabbier, but you don't really... Uh, uh, that's right. Yeah, you, you do notice those differences, and the infrastructure is not as good in East Jerusalem uh, for the Arab communities as it is for the settlers. Um, we traveled on buses mostly, and uh, there there is an Arab bus system, or Arab-Palestinian bus system, and there's a, a, an Israeli-Jewish so when, when you go to um, Hebron from Jerusalem, there I, I know that from the Jerusalem bus station, you can take an Israeli bus, and I assume it goes pretty quickly down to Hebron. How did you get to Hebron? 
we um, we took a taxi. We got there on, on a, a Friday, and uh, not everything moves as well on Friday because of the Muslim prayers. Uh, so we 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 took um, a bus to Bethlehem and went through the checkpoint and got a taxi from there into into Hebron. How long does that take? Uh, about uh, twenty minutes, half an hour. Uh, in in the West Bank, things are not far, and uh, Bethlehem is right next to East Jerusalem on the south, and then Hebron is the next major community uh, south of that. So uh, half an hour, forty five minutes by taxi. It sounded like yeah. there were no checkpoints. Uh, you said um, Highway 60, I assume, going down south. There were no checkpoints in operation when you were doing that, I take it. Uh, well, yes. Uh, once you're in the West Bank on Highway 60, which is a, a basically a settler road, it, it's it's a, a freeway that connects uh, the various uh, Israeli communities, uh, the, the settlements. Uh, but it's not for the Palestinians. Uh, now, some taxi drivers have, have permits to go on that highway. So we were, we got one of those taxis and it dropped us off uh, in downtown Hebron. And what was your, so when there you got buses, to Hebron, There are buses as well. When you got to Hebron, were you um, received by somebody or... Did you have a did you have a program like you, did you fit into an existing program? Yeah, so so we had connections with uh, uh, this uh, uh, organization, this advocacy organization. They have five young Palestinian uh, uh, activists there who uh, who welcomed us. We had had connections through friends here, and uh, they they met us and took us to our flat in the uh, old city of um, Hebron. And that's where we stayed for 10 nights. And uh, while we were there, we, we joined them in some of their monitoring activities at the checkpoints. Uh, a big part of what they do is they keep an eye on the checkpoints, uh, reporting on any incidents of soldiers harassing children as they come through. Uh, Hebron is a very, very divided city, very tense city, and children, some children have to cross checkpoints to get to school every morning. And so our friends there were monitoring uh, those checkpoints. Uh, they also uh, um, facilitated a couple of visits to the Masafar Yata area in the South Hebron Hills, which was quite an eye opener for us. Uh, some of you have heard what's going on there in terms of uh, uh, settlements encroaching on Palestinian uh, rural communities uh, and uh, communities, uh, villages are being uh, slated for demolition to make room for firing zones and so forth. So we were able to observe some of that as well. So just to zoom back out just for a second on Hebron in case not everybody is um, up on it. Hebron is one of the three or four largest Palestinian cities in the West Bank. I think it's the largest, but I'm not sure. And in the middle of it, there are there is a Jewish settlement protected by of, of a couple of hundred people, but protected by several thousand Israeli uh, soldiers. Is that is that consistent? With That's your right. Yeah, uh, Peter, would it be helpful? I, I do have a map that I can show here. Sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, let me just go to it now. Um, uh, okay, this is the West Bank. Just to get a, a sense of where Hebron is, uh, this is uh, the southern part of uh, um, of the West Bank, uh, and you can see Bethlehem there in the middle. Right. Uh, and and then um, uh, and then in terms of Hebron, just just before you just before back on that previous one, just so we're all on the same page. Do you mind? Um, no, well, there. Just so, what are the pink and gray here? What's what are we seeing there? Just so. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, the the whole West Bank is is divided into areas A, B, and C. Areas A are the pink spots. Uh, those are Palestinian controlled uh, communities under the administration of the Palestinian Authority, and the rest of it is area B and A, where if. Uh, essentially, the Israeli government has complete control. A lot of it is open land, rural land, but basically that's where the settlements are being established, is in that part of the West Bank, which is still claimed by the Palestinians. Uh, and and um, so it's, it's set apart for nature reserves, uh, military firing zones, 
uh, and settlements. And as you can see, the Palestinian controlled areas, it's just like uh, people talk about Swiss cheese. It's just a bunch of places that are connected uh, uh, through roads and checkpoints, um, very broken up. And so to get to, from East Jerusalem down to Hebron, we had to sort of skirt around Bethlehem. There are certain roads that we could go on. Highway 60 goes down through here, and we were dropped off in Hebron. Um, and uh, Byron, yeah, I, want to, so, I want to test something on you that I was told when I was there that those, those your your map is very ag accurate in a legal sense, but I was told de facto there's no more A, B, and C. The Israeli military can go anywhere, and while they say it's Palestinian controlled, in fact, as we saw in Ramallah, if the Israeli military wants to go in, they do so. Yeah, that's that's a very good point, and I'm glad you opened with those stories, Peter, because uh, uh, that's right. The Israeli army can go in anywhere, including the capital city of Ramallah, and uh, and they can do what they want. Um, and uh, and that's very true of the city of Hebron. Let me just, if I can find that uh, other map here. Um, uh, da -da. I, I, I'm being blocked here with this. Uh, uh, to do. Uh, Peter, I'm going to just stop sharing and then go back into it. I think it would um, okay. be helpful for people to see the geography of the old city of, of Hebron. And I don't want to spend too much time at it because we only spent 10 of our days there. Uh, but um, uh, well, we, got, we still have a month and a half to go here. <laughs> okay. Um, let me see if... Somehow this uh, window at the top is preventing me from going into the maps that I had lined up. And uh, so I'm gonna have to, um, you know, I think we uh, not get uh, hung up on the uh, technicalities. Let's just, uh, I'll just to try to describe it. Um, uh, Hebron uh, it, uh, is the largest city in the West Bank, I understand. It's uh, over 200,000 people, and, and most of it is Area A under the administration of the Palestinian Authority. But uh, since the 1990s, uh, Israel has taken over uh, a, a big chunk of the city, the, uh, the old city, um, uh, in order to create uh, a uh, contiguous line from a major settlement on the edge of Hebron, the Kiryat Arba, to another smaller settlement, which is right in the center of the of, of, of the city. And so you have a city that's divided between H1, uh, which is under Palestinian authority, and then the other, which is directly under the Israeli authority. And that includes the old city. And then within that H2 area under the control of Israel, uh, there, there, are, there is this strip of land, Shuhada Street, that goes past the Ibrahimi Mosque and then on up to the uh, settlement. And that, that, those roads are restricted to Israelis only. Uh, um, there are certain places where Palestinians can walk and other places where they cannot walk even and restricted only to, to Jewish Israelis. And what's and what's so, the rationale from the Israeli point of view on that? Why do they, why do, they do that? Uh, th there, there are claims. Uh, Hebron used to be a mixed community of, of, of Jews and Palestinians uh, and, and Arabs together, uh, Muslims and, and Jews. Uh, but with the occupation, uh, that has become much more complicated. And with Hebron, Back in 1994, there was that massacre in the Abraham and Mosque. Uh, an extremist settler, uh, Baruch, uh, Baruch uh, Goldstein, came in and massacred, uh, uh, I think, 29 Muslims at worship. And uh, that, that inflamed tensions. And instead of defending the Palestinians, because they were the victims of this attack, uh, the, the Israeli government moved in to protect the settlers so that they would not be attacked by the Palestinians in revenge. Uh, so that, that resulted in, in, in the, these divisions and an increase in, in uh, settlers moving in to Hebron and trying to claim some of their, their old, uh, um, uh, what, 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 what they used to have of that city. Did you, did you talk to, get to talk to any settlers? You know, we, uh, we did not. Uh, 
except uh, just very briefly, occasionally, uh, uh, when we we did walk down Shuhada Street, and we met. It's it's a very uh, it's a very bleak experience because there aren't many people there. There aren't many settlers actually, and there are almost as many soldiers in Hebron protecting these settlers as there are settlers. Uh, but. Um, uh, yeah. Um, the reason why I ask that is, in my experience, uh, the settlers that I've, I haven't had, hardly had any contact with settlers there, but the anywhere for that matter. But the ones I have come across are Americans. They're, they're yeah. they they come from California or Chicago or whatever, yeah. and they have a very clear American accent. That's yeah. why I was asking if that was your. Experience. We we met we met a, a an older man from uh, France um, uh, who was living in the uh, uh, Tel uh, Ramida. Uh, settlement up on the hill uh, at the end of Shuhada Street. I, I could just show you a couple of pictures of Hebron just to um, sure. uh, uh, show you a little bit of the, the division there. Uh, I'm going to go right up to the old city of Hebron here. Um, we, we stayed in this apartment right next to Shahada Street. Um, and these pictures are taken from the roof of our apartment. And we're looking down on this street uh, that used to open up onto Shuhada Street. And then in the 1990s, it was closed. You can see that wall at the end. And, and uh, so Palestinians are not allowed to go on Shuhada Street, which is uh, over here where you see that's, the light. So that's the wall that has that sort of uh, artist uh, yeah. graffiti on it, is that right? That's right. And other streets have been closed off. And behind the camera here is, is the old city where there's an old souk. Uh, but Shuhada Street used to be also a very, a very lively commercial area. And now that is closed off to Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Nobody's allowed to go there. Across the street is a uh, cemetery. Uh, one of our friends has his father buried there. And there's no way that he can get across to see his father's grave, except by coming all the way around in the city and down to uh, uh, through non-restricted areas takes him half an hour uh, um, to, to get from here to that point by going around. Uh, and that's by driving. <laughs> mm -hmm. So and, and then on the other side, you can see uh, in the old city, uh, uh, the settlements are right on top, literally on top of where the Palestinians are living. And so it, a lot of the Palestinians have moved out of this area. You can see there's not a whole lot of life in this street down below. Um, and, and you can see these little uh, shelters on the top where soldiers, uh, Israeli soldiers, again, don't forget that this is all under Israeli control. They can go and monitor all the streets below. And, and then this big building behind with the spotlights, uh, that is uh, part of the, the, uh, one of the settlements that is right there in the old city. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, a long way to say it's a very tense situation, uh, Palestinians and settlers living right on top of each other. And uh, there's, it's no surprise that there's, uh, there are flare-ups of violence, especially during uh, holiday times, uh, uh, especially Jewish holidays, when, uh, when uh, the settlers and Jewish uh, tourists come down to Hebron to, to go to the uh, synagogue, which is in part of the mosque, the Ibrahim Mosque, which is just a little bit to the right uh, uh, at the end of the old city. So, Byron, did you ever feel either see violence or feel in danger yourself when you were there? Uh, we were fortunate to have uh, friends who uh, could advise us and accompany us. Uh, so uh, the short answer, not really. Um, when we were in East Jerusalem with the uh, uh, Mennonite Central Committee, we... Um, uh, we benefited from their UN updates that they got uh, a couple times a week, where uh, they would be alerted to places to avoid. Uh, you know, we were told to avoid any uh, crowds. Uh, when we were in Hebron, our friends uh, took us to the site of some demonstrations um, that had taken place uh, in the wake of uh, Israeli um, incursions into Janina in the north. And whenever something like that happens in the north, the whole West Bank sort of erupts into demonstrations and sometimes violent demonstrations. Um, I can show you a couple of pictures uh, uh, of uh, that as well. Um, we just saw the, the, um, uh, the aftermath. Um, 
and uh, you know tear gas canisters on the street and uh, burning tires. This Hebron. is near, and this is back in Hebron, yes. Mm -hmm. But something similar to this will happen in many West Bank communities when there is a point of tension somewhere else, especially mm -hmm. on Fridays after Muslim prayers. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think we 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 felt safe. Uh, uh, as long as we uh, did not go to demonstrations. Now, while we were in Jerusalem, we did uh, take in a tour of uh, Zokrot, which is a, an Israeli organization that, uh, that uh, educates um, Israelis about the depopulation of, of Palestinian uh, towns and villages in 1948 and since. And we did a tour in Jerusalem in the Lifta neighborhood. And... Um, uh, and after that tour, they, they brought in a lot of people from Tel Aviv to, to see this depopulated, uh, it, well, it's a national park now, uh, but it, it is uh, one of those villages where the ruins are still standing and people can go and visit it. And uh, so this is one thing that Zokro does is educate people. So we, we joined one of those tours. And then afterwards, they were going to go to the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood, um, another Arab uh, neighborhood in uh, uh, Jerusalem, uh, to join a demonstration. And we we could have joined that, but we had committed not to uh, not to do that. Um, so we might have been in a little bit of danger there. But again, if you're a tourist, uh, you really are quite privileged. Um, I asked that question because there might be some people on the on the call who were sort of half tempted to go. And uh, I, when people ask me when I was taking tours there, if it's dangerous, I, I say, actually, it is quite dangerous. The principal danger is highway traffic accidents. And the second danger is falling downstairs in the some of the old buildings. But uh, yeah. you can avoid the other kind of dangers. If, if, you, if your ears to the ground and you have con local contacts, you can avoid, avoid yeah. danger. We were there, at, you know. If you if you saw the news uh, in the first three months of uh, of this year, you would have thought uh, a lot of people would have thought, oh, you know, there's violence happening at every corner. But uh, those were in particular areas. And meanwhile, uh, we were we were impressed. There, uh, the, the tourist trade is back after COVID. There there were lots of tour groups, uh, especially in Jerusalem, and it was coming back in places like Bethlehem as well. Um, not so much in Hebron. Hebron is a harder place to be a tourist, but they do have some great things to see there if you can get down there. Um, I've asked you lots of questions about Hebron, but I've prevented you from going on to the other places, so I should allow you to continue on. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, while we were in East Jerusalem, we were able to visit some of the uh, uh, partners of uh, Mennonite Central Committee. They, they do some good things both in uh, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and, and in Israel, uh, supporting uh, human rights and uh, development issues. Um, so we spent some of our time visiting those uh, 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 things, everything from uh, school programs to uh, programs uh, in the West Bank for um, uh, disadvantaged people, um, uh, adults with disabilities, and uh, so forth. And um, so we found that inspiring. But uh, on our own time, we also took it upon ourselves to interview a number of uh, activists and church leaders uh, through uh, previous contacts and also through friends in Canada who uh, linked us up with uh, uh, some of the um, activists that you, you might recognize. Um, and to give and, us a flavor uh, of some of those conversations. Yeah. Um, so, because of our, our because our our advocacy work is is very much linked to the church, we were particularly interested in how the Christian community uh, is experiencing the occupation and experiencing these days. Um, uh, these particularly heightened. Uh, um, tense days. And uh, so we had a lot of conversations both with uh, elder statesmen of the church, but also uh, some of the younger adults, both men and women. Uh, and um, the flavor, I, I guess one thing I, that kind of surprised us, it shouldn't have surprised us, but it, it, it certainly impressed us, was the level of, um, of pessimism 
uh, there is uh, even among our, our Christian community there. Um, and when I say Christian, I'm talking ecumenically of, uh, of Protestants, Catholics, Orthodox, um, and even evangelicals. Uh, there's quite a spectrum of, of the Christian community, but it is a small minority now. The Christian uh, 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 presence has diminished over the years, largely due to the occupation um, and the struggles that people experience. Um, so it, it, there's only about 45,000 Christians left in the Holy Land. Uh, that's Israel and Palestine together. And uh, those are divided. Includes, among, na includes Nazareth, you're saying. Nazareth. That would include Naz Nazareth. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So there are there are pockets uh, like Nazareth and Bethlehem that have uh, traditionally been strongly Christian, but those uh, the Christian populations are diminishing, particularly in, in Bethlehem. And and uh, we, we we heard a lot of heartache about that, um, especially young adults. Uh, they go to study and they don't come back. Uh, they're abroad, very, you mean? They, go, they, they study abroad and they don't come back. Uh, there are few opportunities for young, educated uh, uh, young adults. Mm. And that is a huge concern for the uh, Christian churches, uh, whether it's Catholic or, or Anglican or Lutheran. We, we spend a fair amount of time with Lutherans and Anglicans. Um, and uh, it, 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 and uh, yeah, one Lutheran pastor in Bethlehem, he said, "We're in panic mode. Um, they they don't they worry for the future." Um, an Anglican priest in Ramallah said, "Yes, this is an ex existential threat. Is what's happening? Is it, it, it's hard for them to maintain their their presence." Um, Byron, I want to ask you a, what might be an awkward question, and you can. Um, avoid it if you want, but my understanding is that um, the churches uh, as organizations um, are dependent on Israeli authorizations. They're, 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 the priests who come there have to get visas and so on and so forth. And that yeah. makes the churches as institutions very compliant, very, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll, exa I'll say it was something with collaborative, that they're, they are going along with the uh, Israelis. Now, I don't. I'm not, I'm not pointing the finger at Mennonites at all. I just think, in general, I think some of the bigger churches. I've heard that accusation. Did you pick up anything, any frustration from um, the Christians you talked to about that? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I don't want to claim to be an authority on this. I'll just to kind of reflect a little bit of what we heard. Um, and there's a difference between uh, the community in Bethlehem, which is in the West Bank, and Jerusalem, which is uh, is uh, annexed uh, by by Israel. Um, and uh, that that concern to preserve their their properties and their ability to to function as churches is 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 probably more pronounced in Jerusalem. Um, uh, we found that, uh, now, yeah, we, we sensed that caution, um, and we sensed, uh, we, we, we heard a variety of responses when we asked about, okay, we, you know, do we go home and use the word apartheid, for example, and, uh, um, and some were saying, uh, everybody agreed that they're living under an apartheid system, effect effectively, but uh, some were saying, well, uh, invite people here to to see for themselves others were saying go home and be very explicit what we need right now is for you to name the injustices call it apartheid call it settler colonialism call it ethnic cleansing uh and so yeah we we saw different nuances depending on the geography and depending on how dependent these uh, uh these church bodies are on the israeli government um in the West Bank, you have more, uh, shall we say, free churches that 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 kind of do their own thing a bit more. Um, and uh, but even even among some of the established churches, we we uh, you know, I, uh, and I, and I think I can quote uh, uh, Reverend Munter Isaac from Bethlehem. I mean, he 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 was the strongest voice we heard, he, and he's written books on this. He said, "You know, we're in a crisis. Go home. Don't don't beat around the bush. Say what you're seeing." Um, so, yeah, uh, I don't know if that answers yeah. uh, the good, question, good, but uh, no, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. By the way, while pausing here, 
I notice a number of people have contributed in the chat, which is fine. Please use it. But um, feel free to put questions in the uh, Q&A. Uh, I see a number of people from recognizing from their names. I can see a number of people have themselves been uh, to uh, Israel-Palestine in the past. And you may have questions you want to pose based on that as well. So please feel free to, to do that using the Q&A function. Byron, back to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I haven't uh, been <laughs> able to read the chat and talk at the same time. So I'm, uh, uh, yeah, I'd encourage you to put questions in the chat. Um, yeah, so uh, in the Christian community, that that's a, it was a constant theme that we heard is that worry. Um, on the other hand, um, we we also were there at a time uh, uh, when. Um, when they declare hope, we were there over Easter, and uh, we saw some some incredible celebrations of of faith and resiliency, um, and, and that's what always impresses us. We go there, and despite the hardships, we we see this persistent hope. Well, one thing that we we heard that we hadn't heard uh, hadn't known before is how how um, how strong uh, the Despite the small numbers, 1% of the, the population, the Christian churches still have an outsized influence in terms of institutions and uh, services in the communities, uh, whether that's schools, hospitals, uh, social services, even though they are often staffed by Muslims and the beneficiaries are often Muslims, uh, they, they are still rooted in the history of the churches uh, from the time when they were much more uh, uh, prominent, particularly in Bethlehem, Bethlehem University, for example. And um, uh, so that was something when we asked what gives them hope, they said, well, you know, we do, we have this presence and uh, the, and we're providing these services and this is something we can do. We can still do this. Uh, despite all the emigration and the uh, restrictions and the creeping annexation all around them, uh, Bethlehem is surrounded by the uh, separation barrier and by settlements. Uh, it, it's really hard. And yet at the same time, there's a, a certain kind of uh, determination and resiliency. And I, and I would say that's not true just of the Christian community. I, we, we saw this among Muslim uh, people that we met as well. Um, it, it, the Palestinians call this this quality samud. It's it's like determination and and uh, uh, con constancy. Um, um, so. I, you made me think. I about ten years ago, I had the opportunity to spend a day at St. George's School, uh, it's an Anglican school in uh, in Jerusalem, and I taught taught classes to a number of the kids. And my first surprise was that although it's an Anglican school, about three quarters of the kids were Muslim. And uh, yeah. because the the uh, what I was told is that the quality of education that Israel offers um, through the Arab school system is so lousy that if parents can't afford it, then they put an emphasis on education. Even if they're Muslim, they're quite quite prepared to send their kids to to Christian schools. That's not a that's not a not a problem for them. I have a question yeah. here. I went from from someone who has been uh, to the region um, uh, with a with a Kairos delegation a number of years ago, I guess. And uh, uh, she, he, or she said that um, they met with a number of Israelis who were quite courageous in opposing the occupation. And he was wondering whether you met people like that and whether you think there's any progress being there in getting them um, active in doing something. Thanks. So that's that's a good uh, um, segue. I, I did want to mention that we we did uh, meet a number of Israeli uh, activists. Um, I, I mentioned Zokrot, um, and uh, they are doing some incredible things. And uh, they, they uh, they're slowly educating the Israeli public because the Israeli public they don't learn about the Nakba, like the the, the dispossession of the Palestinian lands in 1948. Um, they don't learn about that in school, and so it's for Zokrot to to promote this. And uh, uh, we met. Uh, I interviewed one uh, young woman who had uh, who had discovered Zokrot and and uh, had moved to Tel Aviv and wanted to learn about her community and found that uh, that the university is built upon uh, ruined uh, uh, Arab villages, and uh, so she she got kind of converted to the cause and has become quite an activist. 
Um, you're asking about, uh, do, do they get persecuted? Uh, they are tolerated. I mean, Israel uh, touts itself as a democracy. Uh, but yeah, sometimes they are hassled by other Israelis. Uh, most Israelis want to turn their 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 back on the realities or deny it, um, and uh, to have it in their face is is uncomfortable. Um, we we did meet uh, Jeff Halper, who uh, is the um, uh, chair of the committee against uh, Israeli committee against house home demolitions, and uh, we we had a great uh, chat with him in his home. Um, you know, like a lot of people, he is discouraged at the lack of international pressure on on Israel. And he, one thing he told us is, uh, you know, the only way things are going to change over here is if Western governments uh, change, if you elect different governments, uh, because our Western governments are, are very much tied to their economic and political interests. Uh, and uh, they, 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 well, including Canada, and Peter can, is very well versed in this, our own government uh, uh, utters good platitudes about human rights and international law, but, uh, but we don't do anything to hold Israel accountable to their violations of international law. And right, the settlements are one, one aspect Sorry. of it. So then before we left Zohat, I just wanted to mention that uh, I, my understanding is that there's some efforts underway to bring uh, <clears throat> Iten Bronstein to Canada on a uh, cross-country tour. He was the founder of Zuchot, and uh -huh. I will be, if I can, I'll do an interview a webinar with him before he comes. So keep an eye out for that. That should be okay. That should yeah. be very interesting. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just mention one... another. Can I just mention another Please, organization? Uh, uh, um... Ir Amim is, uh, is an Israeli organization that focuses on uh, what's happening in East Jerusalem and the Old City in terms of uh, mm. increased uh, settlement of, of extremist Jewish settlers. Uh, That's an in, Israeli organization, correct? It's an Isra again, it's an Israeli organization, and uh, their, their focus is educating people about what's, what's going on. And uh, you can join their tours. They have them in Hebrew and English. We joined one of theirs uh, where we looked at what was going on in Silwan, which is uh, a neighborhood just below the old city of Jerusalem in the Kid Kidron Valley, uh, where, where homes have been demolished to make way for uh, uh, an archaeological park there, uh, the city of, of David. And uh, uh, very enlightening tours. And again, they get hassled, uh, but uh, they keep on. They're, uh, they're just really courageous activists um, going against the stream of their own society. So, someone uh, posed a question about whether or not it, the, the, your discussion with the church leaders led you to believe that they believe that they're uh, about to disappear. Like, could, uh, are they disappearing? From the, what's their vision of the future for the Christian community and Christian churches? Uh, yeah, well, they, I don't know if it would be an exaggerating uh, exaggeration to say that they fear that uh, they are going to disappear, but they, the language they use is uh, um, the Holy Land needs the living stones. You know, they don't just need Christian museums of, of churches, ancient churches and, and archaeological sites. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they would like to remain uh, as, as a community. Um, and um, for that, they, they, they really cling to the solidarity that uh, Western churches can offer. Mm -hmm. And so they welcome visits. They urge people to come and meet the living stones of the land. Come and see for yourselves what's going on. Um, and when you come, <laughs> don't just stay in Jerusalem and make forays into Bethlehem for like a couple of hours to see this. Uh, come and and stay in the West Bank. It's, it is it is safe. It's not unsafe. There are good hotels in Bethlehem. Come support the Palestinian economy, meet the Christians, go to church with them. Uh, don't just come and go and uh, say you've had a good time. So that, that's essentially a message that we heard over and over again. Did you feel that there was... Um... Maybe you can't measure this, but uh, unanimity or contact between Christians in the West Bank and Christians in Jerusalem. You can go back and forth easily because you've got a Canadian passport. A lot of Christians in the West Bank cannot come into uh, uh, Jerusalem. So uh, are they on different tracks or do you, do, could you pick that up from talking to people or what was the sense of it? Well, uh, 
There are certainly restrictions. And when we uh, we joined the Palm Sunday parade uh, down the Mount of Olives uh, the week before uh, Easter, and uh, it was quite something. There were a lot of international people there. But one thing that we heard from our friends in West Bank is, uh, you know, not everybody could get a permit to go across, you know, so it's only like 10 kilometers from Bethlehem into the Gold City. So uh, that was something that uh, it it was heartbreaking to see, you know, the local Christians not even being able to go in, whether it's going to Palm Sunday or going into Easter celebrations. But there there is contact. I mean, uh, you, you can email back and forth. People can phone. Uh, and they can visit family visits. Uh, there's a fair amount of commerce, and and a lot of the major denominations are are institutionally connected, like the Lutheran Church in Jerusalem, for example, and the Lutheran churches of uh, Bethlehem area, Beit Sahur and uh, Beit Jala and Bethlehem. Um, they, they're they're connected. They're part of the same diocese, uh, and that would be uh, true of the Anglican Church as well. St. George's in East Jerusalem and uh, St. Andrew's in in uh, Ramallah. Uh, but uh, they, they're, they're, there's a slight difference in terms of how they see the authorities and how they experience uh, the danger of the restrictions. So it's, their, it's, their legal situations are quite different, right? That's a... Yeah, their legal situations are, are different um, uh, for sure. And uh, now in terms of freedom of religion in the West Bank, even though it's not, uh, you know, almost all Muslim, they're, they're legally Christians are not being restricted. Some, one of the uh, myths that the Israeli government and especially Christian Zionists uh, like to perpetuate is that the real problem in the West Bank is Muslim persecution of Christians. And, and that's really not the case. There, there are occasional tensions, but it's not persecution. It's um, the, the real problem we, we were told over and over again is the occupation. And, uh, and a, a new reality, a, a growing reality for Christians in Jerusalem is pressure from extremist uh, uh, Jewish um, settlers as well. And you may have seen some of that in the news. Uh, a Christian cemetery uh, on the edge of the old uh, city of Jerusalem was desecrated, uh, um, I think, uh, toward the end of the last year. And uh, there are attacks, uh, particularly uh, in the Armenian quarter. It's a particular Christian group in the Armenian quarter of Old Jerusalem. Uh, settlers are in the adjacent Jewish quarter uh, want to take over that part of the old city. And uh, so there's a lot of harassment. Um, so that's a, that's a reality that we became uh, aware of this time that uh, we weren't so conscious of last time. You know, well, I, I've seen recently, maybe some of on the call, I've seen a little video of some uh, Israeli settlers spitting on a Christian as they walk down the street. I don't really have a sense of how, well, that's really just a very unusual. It's terrible, but whether it's like really unusual behavior or, or whether the tensions are palpable, um, what do you sense of that? We've heard stories like that too. Uh, somebody told us that it, uh, that for certain uh, um, Jewish uh, extremist theologies, uh, and I, I can't say which one, that that their faith requires them to spit on 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 uh, Christians. You know, if, uh, if, you know. Um, um, I wasn't sure what to believe about that, but I have heard about it, incidents like that. Well, what we observed in, uh, we, we often went to the old city of Jerusalem. It's just, just a beautiful place to visit. But what you see there is uh, a growing presence of uh, conservative and orthodox uh, Jewish folks um, coming through the Christian and the Muslim quarters to exert their presence. Uh, and as they go toward the Western Wall, um, uh, some of them are prone to, uh, you know, just harass uh, shopkeepers. We've heard of uh, a cafe near the New Gate that we like to pre- uh, frequent. Uh, people would come through there and overturn the tables on the streets just, just to be. Uh, Who were there during Jerusalem Day? 
We were not there during Jerusalem Day, but uh, it, it, Jerusalem Day sort of takes it to a, a new height where uh, where extremist Jews are coming and asserting their presence uh, in the old city. What we did observe was uh, a growing presence of uh, Jewish visitors to the to uh, uh, the Temple Mount or the uh, Haram Al Sharif, uh, where the Dome of the Rock is. Uh, traditionally, Jews have 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 kept their distance from that. Uh, in fact, there's a law in Jerusalem that prohibits Jews from uh, going onto the uh, onto the Temple Mount. Um, uh, but but a lot of the extremists do. I can even show you, show you pictures. I don't know if I want to take more time. We uh, I realize we we got ten minutes, but um, but we did observe groups coming under police uh, uh, protection. Who would go and and do their uh, walk around on the uh, um, uh, on the Al Aqsa Mosque compound, and uh, that was very. It's been very provocative for Muslims, uh, and so they have to be protected uh, police wise. That's happening more and more, especially under this uh, extremist government that has come in, and uh, there there are sects of Judaism that would really like to. Uh, uh, establish the the new temple and and take action to destroy the dome of the rock and build a, a third temple uh, on the temple mount. Did you get um, to talk, talk to people about big picture politics, like about what they think of the PA or one state, two state? These those questions that the activists in Canada are maybe interested in. Yeah, um, there's uh, a lot of disillusionment over the uh, two-state solution, uh, except if you go to Ramallah and people in, in positions of power uh, will still promote that. Uh, but you, uh, we heard a lot more, um, uh, a lot more people saying something like, "Well, it doesn't really matter if it's one state or two state. The, the, the main question is, do we have equal rights and equal dignity?" Um, and what they fear is that it will be a one state, but an apartheid state um, that where legally uh, Palestinians are, are given second class uh, citizenship. And that, that's already the case in Israel. Uh, you know, Palestinian Israelis do not have all the same privileges as, as, uh, as Jewish Israelis. So yeah, it, it, it's, it's a question, but uh, uh, we didn't get uh, any sort of monolithic answer on on which solution is best. Uh, what we heard a lot of was we don't see any solution. Yeah. Uh, someone asked um, a question. I'm going to try to rephrase it here about um, how are the organizations that you met addressing this issue of ending the occupation and the oppression? What what, what are they doing? <sighs> Um, well, the, the, there are several responses, and the, what you see in the news is uh, disaffected and disillusioned and hopeless young adults taking uh, things into their own hands, and the lion's den. The lion's den, that kind of stuff. The lion's den and the various uh, resistance groups taking a violent uh, approach because they see no other solution. Uh, others are saying, really, we need to double down on the international community. Um, we need to talk to our governments. And, uh, and Peter is very much at the forefront of this. We, uh, there are a number of advocacy groups in Canada that are writing letters, trying to have meetings with our MPs to say, hey, uh, let's not be silent on, on what's going on over there. Let's, uh, we need to hold Israel accountable, accountable to international law. Um, that we, we also saw some, uh, some work, uh, particularly in an organization that we related to, Seville Liberation Theology Center, where they are uh, beginning to look at the whole question of, uh, of anti-Semitism and definitions of anti-Semitism. They're doing that from a Palestinian perspective and, and really encouraging us to really sort out what is, anti what is true anti-Semitism and what, and, and and criticism of Israel is not the same as anti-Semitism. And so they're saying that, and they're telling us to go and, and, and be bold, um, talk about international law. That, that is not a question of ethnicity or um, racism. Um, 
it, it's a question of human dignity for all. Um, um, so yeah, uh, we didn't. Yeah, in terms of what they are doing, um, it, 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 it's that's about. I think that's about all I can think of. Did we, you did you vi visit any of the um, organizations in Ramallah that are involved in DCI Defense of Children or? Uh, uh, oh yeah, we did. Uh, we 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 spent uh, uh, an hour with um, uh, Gerard Horton and uh, Sawan uh, uh, Sawan Dubais. Uh, they work with Military Court Watch, and uh, uh, yeah, they are uh, again working at trying to expose what's what's happening, particularly in the court system when when Palestinian children are arrested and detained. And um, one message from uh, from them that they left with us is we need to encourage our conservative um, uh, uh, judges uh, in our country to go and observe what happens in the military courts and, and see for themselves how Israelis and Palestinians are treated very differently by this, uh, the military court system there. Um, and, uh, you know, they were saying, uh, you know, uh, don't just raise flags and don't just shout the word apartheid. Uh, encourage our people to go over and observe for themselves and come to their own conclusions. One of the things, uh, Byron, that I think a lot of us um, were sort of stunned by is that there was this um, open letter um, organized by Rosalia Bella, who was a member of the Supreme Court, also signed by... Um, uh, the former chair of the Supreme Court, McLaughlin, Beverly McLaughlin, uh, urging Israel to preserve its system of rule of law and uh, in, uh, during all the demonstrations as if Israel had been some kind of model of democracy up till now and that was being threatened. It was quite, um, so I absolutely think that's a great idea if you can get, even get Canadian lawyers to go and look and see. I think that would be uh, a terrific step forward because I think a lot of people have this illusion that Israel is some uh, for it, I mean, it is a is a democracy as far as the Jews go, but it's not democracy either for its own Palestinian citizens of Israel or for Palestinians living under occupation. Of course, there's a deep sense of uh, disappointment in the West Bank. Uh, we heard this over and ago, over again. Disappointment in the Western governments um, at, at the um, what feels to be a a total uh, lack of of concern. And uh, so that's something that we in the activists and advocacy community can, can work at. Uh, just a quote from, again, from Reverend uh, Munter Isaac. He said, you know, Israel could annex Bethlehem tomorrow and nobody would say anything. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody would protest. And uh, th that was how he perceived the reality. We do have an opportunity to wedge in on this a little bit, Byron, as you know, uh, thanks to the work of um, Heather, Heather McPherson at the NDP and some others, yes. uh, a motion was passed at the uh, in the House of Commons uh, Committee on Foreign Relations to review a uh, Canada's policy towards Israel-Palestine. And it's a great opportunity for various groups to get involved. Um, and it's an opportunity for various groups to have their own discussions about what Canada's policy would be. As you've pointed out, Byron, um, a lot of the words uh, on the official government website, which you can look up, uh, sound very positive, but um, when um, uh, Israel does things, Canada is noticeably absent at either even criticizing, let alone actually doing anything about it. So um, I think it's an opportunity to raise the issue amongst our own organizations, but also put some pressure on the government at the same time. Uh, I should say we had we had two um, very interesting conversations with our Canadian rep to Ramallah, mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, we I had written a fairly pointed letter to him about some of the silence of Canada, and uh, he wrote back and said, "Well, let's have a Zoom call." And we said, "Well, we're coming. Uh, can we meet in person?" So he very gracious, very open to hearing from people like us uh, about our concerns. And, and he encouraged us to keep doing that with our politicians, keep, and he's open to talking to people. Of course, he doesn't have that much influence. I mean, he, he, he passes on what he hears to the embassy in Tel Aviv, but um, he encouraged us to just, you know, 
the the Israeli lobby is strong. They hear from them all the time. They need to hear from people who are are concerned about uh, about our silence. And so, um, just a word uh, to you all out there. Well, we're just about getting to the end of our of our time here, um, Byron. I first of all, hats off to you for you and your wife for um, spending quite a bit of time and you know, your own time and money and energy uh, in becoming informed about this and. Thank you for sharing your observations with uh, with all of us. Um, I think it's a, that's your, the picture of your wife. I take it there in the yes, <laughs> in, the, in the and rethink Palestine is a good uh, a good yeah, motto. That's, uh, so, uh, yes, yeah, so right. you got some last words, um, Byron, before we let you go. Well, we could have uh, talked uh, a lot longer. Uh, I, and uh, if 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 people want to take more time, uh, I'm available for that. But um, we can we can extend it by another ten minutes if you want. I mean, well, well I um, I I would just uh, I think put out a, a, an encouragement to people to not. Uh, to, to to visit the land uh, now, you know, with climate change and everything, that uh, it's always uh, a question how much we travel. But at the same time, I, I think it's it's a real encouragement when they see people coming over and being in solidarity with uh, with Palestinians, particularly in the West Bank. Um, so uh, and and advocate. Uh, and I, maybe I'll just close with this. When we, we, we talked to a few people and they said, you know, the situation seems hopeless, but I'm going to hang in there. Reverend Munter Isaac was one who said, you know, um, when things change, I want to have been on this scene and been part of that change. Um, he doesn't want to turn his back and then regret, you know, 30 years from now, oh, I should have done something. Um, and uh, so there was a rem reminder that, uh, as, as Martin Luther King said, um, you know, the arc of history is long, but it bends toward justice. And, and there, there was a sense among some of the people that we talked with is, yeah, it looks hopeless, but we, we know that uh, tyranny can't last forever, and it's going to fall one of these days. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we want to be there when it happens, and we want to be part of it. And we don't want to be thinking afterwards, oh, we should have. Uh, and of course, that that harkens back to, you know, uh, the early part of the 20th century when people were were turning their backs on the situation of, of the Jews in, in Germany, and then uh, you know, um, and then later thinking, oh yes, we should have done something. You know, um, now I don't want to just equate these situations, but it, it's it's something that I think in some ways. Uh, we, we need to attend to. And it's not just over in Israel-Palestine. I mean, uh, uh, the other thing I want to say, and we, we talked with people about this too, is Canada is also guilty of settler colonialism. We have our own injustices and our own uh, shadows to deal with on our own history. So the more we can link ourselves to, to our own history, the more we're going to understand what's going on in Israel-Palestine. And uh, uh, so we, what we heard a, a lot of was... Um, Get involved in justice work, uh, whether it's here or in your own country. We all need to be working at it together, and uh, that was kind of a generous comment for people. You know, it wasn't just saying, you know, support us, uh, please support us. We also support you in your struggle, and um, so that uh, uh, maybe I'll just end with that. And if there are questions, I'm happy to stay on as long as you want. Uh, if, if, if some questions pop, pop up immediately in the q and I'll do that. Otherwise, I'll, uh, uh, you're, you're, you're reachable by email. Um, uh, Byron, can I share your email address to people when I do my follow-up uh, letter in case people do have questions they want to ask? Yeah, I I think so. I, I didn't check with Melita, but uh, sure, yeah. Um, oh, you check, you check you, it. Do you have it there to paste in? Or? Follow up email. They, people can write me, and I can pass them on if there are questions that people want to ask me. But um, I yeah. think you you far overplayed <laughs> my um, importance in this. I um, there, are, there are lots of good people and good organizations in Canada that are working. People uh, organizations like yours, CGPME, IGV, uh, Anjapi. I've seen people from different organizations on the call. Um, it's kind of a, an orchestra, and we have to work together towards. Um, I I hope we hurry up. I'm 77, so I hope we hurry up and get the arc of justice going in the right direction <laughs> sooner than later. Anyway, on behalf of um, 
uh, uh, the Forum Israel Palestine and half of all the people who are attending. Uh, Byron, thank you so much for your contribution today. And thanks to everybody who has uh, participated in this. I see that the registration uh, remain very high right till the end, which is always a always a good sign. So on a on a on a, on a beautiful summer evening. So Byron, yeah. thank you so much. Thanks everybody for your interest. All the best. Have a good summer. Yeah.